It is incumbent upon those of us who've had a good career to help the people who haven't, just as the people when we were starting, there were people that reached down and helped us up. We, we stand on the shoulders of the people that came before. Now it's our turn to help the people who need help. Now we talk about the one percenters, you know, are they, yeah, will they feel it? Yeah, they'll feel it. Are they gonna feel the pain that a young writer who just got a deal and now they can't work or the younger actor who just got a pilot and now that pilot's on the shelf? So when you, as an audience member, as your listeners who don't understand this paradigm, understand that you're talking to actors on the screen here who have careers and who've established themselves at various levels. But we're not talking about that even. We're talking about the people who haven't established anything at all. We're fighting for all of us. We're fighting for everybody. My, because I'm doing well doesn't mean my industry's healthy. Welcome to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I am your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. And this is a special edition of Trek Untold because today we're talking about some current events. And they're not taking place necessarily within that sci-fi franchise we're typically discussing here on this podcast. Today we're looking at some real world events that are going to very much affect not just that particular franchise, but really the entire industry around it. Some of the biggest news in America right now is that Hollywood has essentially gone on strike and the entire industry surrounding them has shut down with this strike. And this is especially notable because this is the first time in a long time where something to this degree has happened as far as a strike goes in Hollywood. So I've seen across social media, lots of discussion about this, lots of discourse going on about what's happening currently. And I feel like there's a lot of misinformation out there. And honestly, I've seen it from a lot of Trekkies too. I've spoken on this show how I feel like there kind of are two separate types of fans for Star Trek. And right now seeing the reaction to the strike and what's going on across the entire Hollywood industry, it's been a little disheartening to be honest. There's so much erroneous stuff out there. And not only that, just terrible takes from people who are quite honestly louder than they should be in this situation. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, of course. But if you can go that extra step to actually reinforce your opinion with some facts, maybe there would be some more credence to it. And that's why I decided to devote today's episode all about what's happening in Hollywood to clear up a lot of that misinformation and give you guys a much, much deeper insight into what's really happening. And the way we're gonna talk about this today is by having it be discussed by folks who are actually very much directly involved in what's happening and directly being affected by what's happening. Today, I'm very honored and privileged to tell you guys that we have six guests joining us to talk all about this, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves right now. Hi, I'm Lisa Clank. I've been a member of the Writers Guild since 1996, and I'm gonna stay out on the picket lines until we get a fair deal. Hi, my name is Bertella Damas. I became a member of SAG in 1985. And um, I also served on the board of directors between 2010 and 2015, first with the Screen Actors Guild and then after the merger with SAG-AFTRA. And I was also the national chair of the EEOC for seven years. Hi, I'm Judy Schrink. I believe I joined in 1979. And I joined AFTRA before that in 1977. I'm really old. I am a former vice president of Screen Actors Guild. Uh, I served as a trustee of the Pension and Health Plan for 14 years and was the chair of many committees. And Armin? I believe my membership uh, started in 1972 before some of you were born. <laughs> um, I'm still a member. Uh, I was a national board member for SAG, I believe, for about seven years, but I don't remember the years exactly. During that time, however, I was one of the co-chairs for one of the contract negotiating committees. I believe it was 99, it could be a little 2001. Late. 2001, thank you, Judy. Uh, and I was uh, chair of several committees. Most notably, I was a co-chair of the Agent Relations Committee uh, when it was there at Screen Actors Guild. 
I am Phil Morris. Uh, I've been a member of SAG since 1969. My father is Greg Morris from the original Mission Impossible series. I am not uh, an executive. I have never spent time on a board. I've just been around the business since I was 10 years old. And before that, I've been through many, many strikes. I've seen a lot of pain and suffering. And that's kind of why I'm here today, just to give you my experience from a longtime member. So I'm the babe, I guess. I'm uh, Tim Lunabus, and I've been a member since uh, I believe it's 1990. And that was up in Northern California, and I moved down in 91 to pursue a career down here. And I'm thrilled to be doing this with Armin and Kitty because they actually were the first ones to sort of introduce me to the inner workings of SAG and, and the politics and the boards, all that stuff. So this is great. Now, fans of this particular podcast might recognize some of these folks already as previous guests on this show, and I'm not going to really mention what they did because that kind of does go against a little bit of what they're currently standing up for, but if you want to look up who they are and hear their podcast episodes, of course, more power to you, please do that. And you can do that by just searching for the names in the show archives. But today's discussion has absolutely zero to do with them breaking down their performances or their skills and abilities. Today is about what they stand for and what they're fighting for. And to be completely honest with you also, it's not the easiest thing to talk about for a number of reasons. The first one being for me that really I am an outsider looking in just like all of you guys are. I might feel like I'm a little bit closer to things just because of this podcast and because of what I've learned and such, but at the end of the day, I'm not really directly affected by this, so I'm not as invested in it. Invested to the degree that these performers and this writer are. There is so much nuance and complexity in this conversation today, stuff that I think the majority of folks that they really have no idea about. We, we kind of see the big picture of what's going on, but we don't really know anything about the intricate little details that have made this situation become so severe. And what I hope for everybody who's watching or listening to today's episode of Trek Untold walk away with from this one is a better understanding of what's going on, and most importantly, why this actually affects you. Because believe it or not, it actually does. And not just based on the entertainment that you're gonna not be able to see for a little while. There's actually a much deeper thing that's happening here that we're gonna talk all about in a few moments. Before we get started, I kinda of wanna break down a few terms to give you guys just an overarching picture of what's currently happening here. Very recently, I wrote an article on my friend's site, rageworks.net, all about this. Basically, it's a little bit of a quick primer on what's going on here. So I'm going to be reading you guys word for word what I wrote on that article, and I'm going to have a link to it in the show notes, as well as, if you check them out, a whole bunch of other links to things that we'll be mentioning throughout the show, other topics that you get a chance to cover, and of course, ways that you guys can support the fund and what's happening with the folks on strike. But as for the story itself of what's happening in Hollywood, let's take this from the top. And this all begins with the WGA. The Writers Guild of America, here on referred to as the WGA, represents approximately 20,000 writers working in TV, film, radio, and forms of quote-unquote new media, which can be a variety of different things. The WGA were the first ones to go on strike in May due to failed negotiations, and not too long thereafter, SAG-AFTRA joined in their efforts. And that very long acronym, by the way, stands for the Screen Actors Guild, that makes up the SAG part of it. And AFTRA is the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. These two groups used to be separate. It wasn't actually that long ago. They were separate entities entirely, but they merged together not that long ago to form a much stronger union in SAG-AFTRA. And the members that fall under that umbrella are actors, stunt performers, voiceover artists, recording artists, dancers, radio personalities, and most recently even, some internet influencers along with some other various media personalities and professionals who make up the 160,000 members of SAG-AFTRA. These groups have various contracts that come up for negotiation after some time periods, and that's essentially what's going on right now. And who these groups go to negotiate with is the AMPTP. The AMPTP is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. And this organization essentially consists of the movie studios or the film studios, places like NBC Universal, ABC, Fox, and other private production companies, such as the streaming giants like Netflix, like Apple TV, and other large tech companies and corporations that now also have a piece of this pie. And of course, there's plenty that I'm not naming here. I, I just forgot to mention Warner Brothers. I realized Warner Brothers Discovery. So there's a lot of folks here. And if you want to learn who is actually a part of this organization, you guys can check that out. I will have links again to that information as well in the show notes. Because again, this is very complex stuff. This is a lot of stuff to try and squeeze into one episode of a podcast. And I hope that this inspires you to dig a little bit deeper yourself and start finding out really what is at the core of these organizations and what they stand for. And that's where this conversation starts to get a little bit more interesting because that is where we get into the discussion about AI. And we're going to talk plenty about that here, but AI is one of those major problems. And a part of that AI comes from these tech giants 
being part of the AMPTP. We're gonna talk a ton about AI, don't you worry, but as I mentioned here, we're kinda of just at the beginning of things. We're kinda of setting the stage right now. So let's chat with one of our first guests today, and that's Lisa Klink. Lisa, again, was a previous guest on this podcast, so we wanna learn more about her. We did a wonderful two-parter, and she's also a proud member of the WGA and has been for quite some time. Due to a scheduling conflict and frankly just weird timing because this episode kind of came together very quickly under short notice, Lisa wasn't able to join the actors in their very big roundtable discussion, but I still wanted to make sure that WGA was represented here in this podcast. So we're going to right now hear from Lisa and she's going to help tell us really how this all began. And that starts back in May when the WGA initially went on strike. So Lisa, there's a lot to break down here with everything that's going on right now in Hollywood. And really this story begins with the Writers Guild. Uh, yeah. You guys were basically the ones that kind of were the precursor to what's happening now across the entire industry. So if you can for me, please kind of uh, paint a picture for my audience of what were the events that led up to the strike with the WGA initially happening? Well, the business changed a lot with streaming. And uh, used to be, you know, back in my day, um, they would have something like 22 episodes a season. And the writers would basically stay on, you know, through production and, you know, would sort of produce their episodes. And what happened with streaming is that you got a lot shorter seasons. You would have eight or 10 episodes. And they got into doing something called a mini room where they would have, you know, just maybe just two or three writers in and to, to break and they would break and write the entire season and then they would go away and production would start. And... As a result, you know, it's it's tough to to make a make a full living on eight to ten episodes a year. And it's also tough to learn how to be a producer if you're not allowed to produce your own episodes. And so it really has become very, very difficult to actually make a living as a writer. So when we talk about the writer's room, that is literally what it sounds like, right? That is a room full of writers who are working on this show. So why are they trying to shrink this down? I mean, why not have more creative minds working on this stuff and contributing and working on something to make it better? Well, they, it's money. It's always about money. They they don't want to pay, you know, a bunch of writers. But that's one of the things we're talking about is, is the influence of AI. And what a lot of writers are afraid of is that the studios are going to use AI to generate sort of the crappy version of the script and then bring in a writer to uh, revise it at half the price of what you would pay a writer to write something original. And it really all comes down to they're trying to, to cut costs in every way possible. How long was the WGA talking with the AMPTP before a strike was initiated? I mean, how long were negotiations going for? I believe it was a few weeks, but I would have to double check that. Okay. You know, strikes are meant to be the last resort in this situation here, but like, it, it seems like a big deal this is happening. I mean, it was, it kind of felt like it was an unexpected thing for us outsiders, but for folks who are in the guild, I mean, did you know that there was a very high possibility this is what it would come out to be? Yeah, unfortunately, because the studios just did not bring any kind of deal to the table. Uh, you know, we were asking for things like, you know, better pay, uh, bigger room size, and also residuals were a big deal uh, because streamers often don't share what their ratings are. And so that makes it impossible for us to calculate any residuals. And they are determined not to share that information with us and not to uh, hire more writers for longer and uh, not to make any promises about the use of AI. And all of that came together to just make it impossible. Lisa does make an interesting point here about these streaming platforms and how their information is really very, very well hidden from the public and even the folks who are part of the system. TV ratings used to be the most important thing about a TV show, but now that so many things have switched over to the world of digital streaming platforms, ratings don't really mean as much. But even with that, those numbers are still out there. You can still find out that information. With streaming stuff, it's a lot harder to track down those analytics, those metrics, and for the most part, we have to kind of take the word of those platforms as to what's actually happening, what's causing the decisions of things behind the scenes. And I think I'm not alone when I say that there's a lot of folks out there who have felt disappointed by certain shows, which we think are very, very popular, and then suddenly they get canceled for no warning, no reason, just Netflix or whoever decides, nah, we're gonna cut the cord here. That could be due to expenses, it could be due to the actual popularity of the show that we maybe are not perceiving correctly, but again, we don't really have any concrete evidence to prove what the actual issue would be. But let's jump back into this conversation right now because Lisa still has a lot more to say. 
there's a lot of writers who start in the industry as writers and then they work their way up to becoming producers. Mm -hmm. And it feels like there's kind of like a consensus from the AMPTP that they're trying to prevent that. Is yes. that the kind of feeling? You certainly get that impression because they are taking away the sort of the mentorship, if you will, you know, that, that a good showrunner offers to his or her staff to, yeah, help you gain experience in, you know, casting and production meetings and editing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, other than the money, I mean, it feels like a lot of this has come down to corporate greed, for lack of a better term, honestly, because when you really look at what the AMPTP is now, it's not just movie studios. We're talking about Apple, Netflix, and really, these are big tech companies. So it feels like they're really trying to kind of just uh, take over from within. Yeah, they, they don't like having to deal with writers um, and have it because I guess we're unpredictable and, you know, we actually demand our rights. Uh, you know, they would rather be able to just plug in a formula and spit out product on the other end. And so I think that they are they are trying to maintain control, you know, by by not allowing us to to become educated producers, you know, then they they are sort of holding onto the reins. That's kind of like a perfect way to get into a deeper chat about AI because a lot of folks are saying how, you know, AI, it's an emerging technology, but it's not there yet. So it's not a danger yet, but in reality, it is because executives are trying to teach this AI to do what folks like you do, what our actors we're going to be speaking with on the show as well do. So it's not a problem at this moment necessarily, but it can very much become a very, very large one, not just in your industry, but really across many professions. That's really true. Uh, I, I think a lot of bosses out there are trying to figure out how to replace their employees with you know, their PC and just crank out the work in a steady way and being able to, to work 24 seven and not have to accommodate their employees at all. Well, on the other hand, there's a lot of folks who are in favor of AI and, and I don't agree with them. I'm not one of those people, but there's a lot of folks who see like the strength of AI uh, and they don't mind that it's gonna kill creative folks' jobs. They, they don't care, they don't see it that way. So for folks who are saying things like that, I mean, what is your response and why is it so necessary to have a human being driving this and not an AI? Well, as I understand it, AI basically has to be fed, you know, a whole lot of examples of, you know, say screenplays, and they sort of look at the, the common elements and then generate, you know, an original screenplay based on everything else that they have absorbed, which is really not very creative and is not inspired. And what you're going to do is you're going to crank out the same movie sort of again and again and again. And I think what you know, a human writer brings you is creativity and inspiration and maybe thinking outside the box a little bit. And you wouldn't have gotten the Barbie movie from a computer. One of the things that's like a major point of contention is residuals. And I believe writers are also affected by that. So uh, yes. I know very little about residuals in the world of writing. So can you kind of like fill me in a little bit about how that works on your side of the picture and what you guys are specifically fighting for in terms of residuals now? Well, the way it works is that you, um, like when I was on Voyager, you know, I'd get a script fee for the, you know, and I would get my salary. Uh, but then I would also get residuals every time the episode that I wrote would rerun, thereby making more money for the studio. I got a little bit of that. And it, especially something like Star Trek, which is going to rerun into infinity. Uh, you know, I, I would get, you know, obviously smaller and smaller residuals as time went on. But the idea is to, to share in the success. You know, if something that we create goes on to be very successful and make a lot of money for the studio, we think it's only fair that we get a little share of that. I think there's also a lot of people don't really understand the reason for the existence of them, even with that said. I mean, because a lot of folks will view this as you did the job, it's done. Why are you getting paid again for it? So to kind of just go a little bit more in detail what you just said, I mean, really, why? Well, the trick is, to make a living, <laughs> um, because even when you're working 22 episodes, uh, there's going to be a lot of downtime and, you know, shows get canceled and it's it's really unpredictable. I mean, as a writer, either a TV or a film, you cannot count on working the full year or making very much salary. You, you just can't count on it. And so residuals kind of help, you know, fill in the gaps between actual paid work you can at least count on residuals to get you through. I mean, essentially, everybody that's in this industry on both sides of the coin here are full-time freelancers. Is that a good way to put it? Yes. I mean, that's they're trying to turn us into gig workers, basically. Mm. Um, 
you know, whereas it used to, again, it used to be, you know, to have a staff that would be on for months and they are trying to, to whittle that down to, you know, just two or three writers who were there for a few weeks. But one of the benefits for the AMPTP and those studios that are trying to do that is that they can pay you less and you qualify for less healthcare benefits. So uh, can you kind of talk to us about what you guys are fighting for in terms of what's not being given to you enough of? Well, obviously job security is is the, the tough thing, but they can't really assure, you know, that. Um, so again, we have to get an increase in pay um, to be commensurate with, you know, the rising cost of living. And, you know, rent goes up, I think our salaries should go up. And also residuals, as you mentioned, there's, that's a really important uh, thing. And it just, any, any kind of, any kind of security, any kind of assurance that you're going to be carried through the rough times, hmm. you know, that you're going to have residuals, you're going to have the money that you made when you were on staff. And staff writers can make pretty good money because, again, it has to carry you through those downtimes. Now, this isn't the first time, even in the last few decades, that writers have gone on strike. And the most recent one was in 2007. And as I mentioned, Lisa wasn't able to actually join the actors with their conversation, but they were very sympathetic to the plights of that union. Many rooms are a pain in the ass to the writers, and, and that's an issue we don't have, but one that has to be addressed on the writer's side. Partially because they don't, I'm just going to speak for the writers really quickly, they, they no longer want the, the writers to be on the set. They no longer want the writers to learn the path to becoming Producers. a producer or an executive producer and being a showrunner. They're just saying, all you can do is sit in a room and write, and then you go away. So they get less money, and they don't learn the skill to become the next person who is a uh, creating show. Creating yeah. And they'll, they'll have them like, instead of having them throughout a project, it's now just pre-production and you guys get in a room for a small amount of time to create, you know, the, 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 the scripts, et cetera. And then you can all leave and then we'll just keep one of you maybe to be the showrunner. And if there's any issues, that person can handle it. It's ridiculous. And the whole thing is the real, uh, why, uh, movies and television shows are so good when they are it's because of rewrites it's because they're reworking all of this so that first draft that they gave you that you're working with that shouldn't be the final product now this strike is pretty different because this is one of the first times in a long time in fact since 1960 that the wga and sag aftra are side by side an acting union and a writing union are going head to head against the amptp what is the significance of this? And uh, again, like, how did they join the fight? Well, I think the significance is that they're being affected by streaming uh, much the same way that writers are, in that there are, you know, shorter orders. And so if you're a regular on a series, you know, you have far fewer episodes to be in. And residuals are an issue for, for actors as well as writers. And AI is actually even more threatening, I think, to actors right now than it is to writers because all they have to do is d digitally scan your face and studios are trying to get it so that they would get a scan an actor and then be able to use them in perpetuity with no further compensation. Hmm. Um, so I, it, it's really a, a largely a matter of respect that, you know, acknowledging that writers and actors are the creative force behind this product and that the studios do in fact need us hmm. and that we really just want to be treated as partners more than employees. I feel like this is almost like a little tiny piece of a much bigger picture of respect for the arts in general. You know, I see plenty of people who want to go to comic cons who will be walking down artist alley and they'll be like, that's 20 bucks. I'd give them five, maybe, you know, things like that. Yeah. You hear stuff like that where people just don't really value or appreciate or understand the significance of art in general. And that's what folks like you do. That's what the actors do as well. So it really just feels like, again, this is a corporatization thing that's happening. It's like they're trying to take the humanity out of something that is all about humanity. Exactly. I mean, you're, you're never going to get genuine feeling, you know, from, from an AI. You know, they could simulate it, but it's, it's never going to come from the heart, obviously. And it's not going to come from personal experience and personal relationships. And basically what what makes us individuals is what we bring to the work and ai kind of synthesizes you know a whole bunch of different works and spits out i think the most generic version 
So what do you feel like is the biggest difference between that strike in 2007, 2008 to what we have right now here in 2023? Well, I think that there's there's an awful lot of support behind us this time, I think, even more than there was in, in 2007. I mean, not only from the actors, but from the public. I feel like, and again, if you look at social media, if you read news stories, they really seem to be largely supportive of the unions. and. The, the sort of the cor corporate greed that we are facing is something that a lot of people in a lot of industries are facing. Mm -hmm. And so I think they tend to sympathize with us. So we really feel like we have, you know, a whole army behind us in a way that maybe we didn't before. And you mentioned, and we've seen photos of you on social media that you've been picketing, you've been part of the picket lines, you've been showing up with your signs, which is awesome. So thank you for doing that. Um, but, you know, that's right now. This is right now as we're filming this. This is late July. Strikes have only been on for a little while. The studios, there's been rumor that, you know, they're not going to even come back to the table till maybe the fall, maybe. And they kind of just want to bleed you guys out, make you guys really sweat it out and wait till you're the most desperate before they even come back to the table. So what's kind of the feeling among the folks who are out there on the front lines? And what's the hopes for how this will resolve itself? Well, I think the more that the AMPTP make themselves the clear bad guys, you know, we want to starve you out of your homes and we want to, you know, wait till you're desperate and all that kind of stuff really just kind of reinforces the idea that we need to stand our ground, that we are dealing with actual malice, you know, coming from, from the studios. And again, the, the word that I've gotten on the lines is that really it, it just makes us more mad and more determined and that we are willing to stick it out as long as it takes. And that, again, with, with public support behind us, especially you know when the fall rolls around and there are no new episodes of anything, I think the public is going to blame the right people, which is the studios. That's a good point to bring up right now. And really, how soon are we gonna start seeing the effects of the strike? Is it gonna be as soon as the fall season? I think we're seeing it now. I mean, production is shut down all over Los Angeles and, and New York, from my understanding. Um, and so a lot of, you know, scripted dramas like, uh, uh, you know, that are trying to um, start in the summer. Uh, I mean, there are in, in a lot of movies certainly have shut down. Mm. So I think that very soon we're going to feel the, the scarcity of new product. So Lisa, a big question is for listeners out there and myself as well included. How can we support what the writers are doing? How can we support the writers who are on strike? Well, the best way is to contribute to the Entertainment Community Fund, which is actually going to help the people who are affected by the strike, the crews, basically, uh, who are feeling the, the consequences of this strike right now. Uh, that is, I think, a, a really good way to help. Um, I know that some people have been talking about, you know, not going to the movies and cutting their streaming services, and that is not helpful. Uh, if you have a big, huge success, you know, like Barbie or Oppenheimer, then that kind of supports our argument that we are making money for the studios. We are making lots of money for the studios and they really need to share. I think there's a misconception that everyone in Hollywood is rich, you know, or that anybody, everybody in the entertainment business is rich, which is really not true. As I mentioned, especially with the shorter seasons, we're all kind of scrambling, you know, to, to put together an entire year of work. And a lot of writers and a lot of actors are taking second jobs, you know, outside the industry just to make ends meet. And so I really, uh, most of the writers and actors are, are working class and are not living the life of, you know, George Clooney and Brad Pitt and those people. I also want to really impress upon you how momentous this event is that's happening right now, this current strike in Hollywood, because this is the first time in decades that a writer's union and an acting union have joined forces to go up against the AMPTP or another negotiating body. And when was the last time this happened? Well, believe it or not, 1960. That's right, all the way back in 1960. And you probably wouldn't even believe me if I told you who was the one who was essentially the head of what was going on in the negotiations, because it's kind of a shocker, but 
Ronald Reagan was actually the person who negotiated for many of those things back in 1960. And Ronald Reagan is frankly responsible for a lot of the things that actors and writers and everybody else that's covered under these unions get now in their current deals. Reagan did a ton of things here, and it's really kind of ironic to look at that because, you know, you go from Reagan working with these unions and their sort of socialist ideas to what his presidency was as the American president, they're pretty darn polar opposites in so many ways. I mean, he deregulated so many things for better or for worse. That's up for debate, of course, that's a different episode, but it's pretty big stark contrast with each other of what he did here, what he accomplished in 1960. But these things were so important that they very much stuck and have evolved over time, but at this point, they kind of have actually stopped evolving. And that's a major reason why this strike is happening, because these new deals have not kept up with the times, and that is where the problems arise. So that's the writer's perspective from Lisa Klink, but let's turn now to a discussion with some of the performers that we know. And I want to admit here, even as I'm recording this intro and all these little segmented pieces here to cut into the episode later on, I am not an expert on this by any means. Even me saying things like union or calling certain things, giving things descriptions or titles or whatever, I'm not the foremost knowledgeable person on this stuff out there. I did my homework, but do my homework only goes so far because this is stuff that's really kind of beyond my grasp. And unless you're somebody who's actually involved in a union of their own, chances are a lot of you guys are also gonna be struggling with some of these definitions and these terms. And that's why I brought in these performers to kind of help us figure things out and break it down in a way that we can all understand. And I'll admit that I made plenty of mistakes here in this interview, and I'm very grateful for the corrections that I had, because if I'm making these mistakes with all the homework and all the research that I did before this chat, chances are a lot of folks out there who are everyday casual listeners of this podcast, or those who just have a peripheral understanding of what's happening in this strike, there's gotta be a lot of things that you're missing, a lot of pieces of the puzzle that you haven't been able to put together. So at this point, you're gonna hear a lot less from me during this roundtable discussion, and that's probably for the best. So now it's time to get educated on what's actually happening with the actors and the Hollywood strike, how this affects an entire industry, not just of performers, not just of even the writers, but really expands far beyond it to the entire industry itself. And most importantly, how this affects somebody like you and me. Well, thank you guys all for being here today to chat with us here. There's a lot to break down here. There's frankly a lot of misinformation out there. And I think the first thing I kind of want to start with is just the strike itself, because truly strikes are the last resort. And there's been months of negotiating that a lot of us were not privy to. And then all of a sudden, you know, the I want to correct you right there for the screen yeah. deal, there were not months of negotiation. There was only three weeks of negotiation. There was, was there was free work done in the guild itself, but but the actual negotiations were rather short, only three weeks. Usually they're longer. Well, they did extend it, and that was an issue. They extended because they started late. Uh, and and negotiations is you know when you're just waiting around to get a response you know that's not really a negotiation when they're not coming to the table at times. Well, they they didn't during the tension. We were out for five days of the twelve days that they asked for an extension. They left for twelve for five days yeah. of that. Yes, but it was uh, it, it, it altogether it was thirty five days uh, with the extension. Um, and I know because my husband was on the negotiating committee. Right. He still is on the negotiating committee. <laughs> Although I'd like him not to be, but okay, he still is. And um, and I've also served on two uh, negotiating committees. So this was, in, in a sense, that big of an extension was unusual. We have extended in the past for a day or two days or even just till like three in the morning, but not like this. So I guess my kind of follow-up to that then is essentially what happened, what went wrong that then led to the strike actually being a necessity? Well, since none of us were sitting there, except for Tilda's husband, um, uh, I, we can't, I can't put one answer to that because I don't know I wasn't there. The truth is, the other side did not want to negotiate in good faith is my understanding. Mm. They just, they just kept coming back with everything less than and not even meeting or reaching anything close to what the actors were asking for. Um, and I think you can see that if you go to the website, there is a, a great breakdown of what the proposals were and what the responses were. Uh, and I mean, when you have an AI proposal and, and they come back with, you know, we're just going to scan this one background actor uh, and then use that image in perpetuity and forever and ever, right? Uh, that's a problem with one day's pay. So that's just a hop, skip, and a jump to doing that to a principal actor or any actor, really, you know, performer, stunt performer, with the range of 
of, of membership. So there was just an egregiousness and a kind of sense that we were being um, disrespected, ignored. Uh, I mean, when you come in and you want an 11% rate hike and they come back at you with three, two, three, two, two, and then five, not even five, right, William? So, uh, I mean, that's just completely ignoring us completely. And I, and I think as a guild, we have, we have, we have behaved as good sports for way too long. We've been good sports and it's just over. You know, there's only just so long we can be a good sport. And these guys are no better than I do, but, you know, my belief is that, you know, unlike the past where it was, you know, studios running the negotiations from their side in terms of driving it, it's now it's, it's so corporate and you have these big streamers that are involved now and are sort of dictating. It just seems like it's becoming a lot more hardcore, uh, cold, sterile and uh, bottom line. Just to weigh in from a performer's point of view, I have no idea about the negotiate. Oh, I do a little bit, but not certainly as, as much as our panel here. Uh, I think there's a philosophical difference, you know? I mean, there's a there's a we thing on the on the side of the unions. It's a we thing. And the AMPTP is a me thing. And uh, that's a philosophical difference. And that's where we have had trouble. It doesn't matter what strike you, 1980, back in the 30s, I mean, there's just a philosophical difference in that the village is not um, being served. And without this village, they produce no thing. There is no thing that they can produce. So what has to happen, in my opinion, what has to happen is an understanding that all of these crafts, all of these departments, all these unions contribute to this whole. And the more that we philosophically refuse to acknowledge that we are all a part of the whole and that they're the puppet masters, and we're basically the slaves, we're always gonna have problems. We're just always gonna have problems, no matter what the numbers are. And so we have to get to the point where we understand the contributions of everybody. And without those contributions, we don't have anything. Uh, Armin and we all have done conventions. We go to conventions quite a bit. If we're fortunate enough to have the kind of career that people will respond to our, our, our work. Without those people, there's no me. Without that, that audience, I, I can't exist. It's the same here. Without us, they can't exist because it just cannot happen by itself. And there has to be a response. And when we get to the point of respect, honor, and integrity, then we'll have a conversation. Until then, it is negotiation and it's hardcore. Welcome to America. Yeah, and I think it's important we bring out some sort of nuts and bolts for your uh, viewers and listeners because we're all speaking because we understand inherently what's going on and and what has impacted this and what has impacted us. And, uh, you know, in the in the old days of uh, network television and uh, residuals, you would work on something, you would get paid for whether it's the day or the week. It used to always be the week. And then in at some negotiation, then it became like, you know, trying to pay us for a day or three days to get in what they would have had, you know, in a week. And then now, and then you would get whenever it would air, whether on network, you'd get, you know, a certain amount, a good chunk. Uh, when it went to cable, you'd get more. And uh, and as long as it kept airing, you would get, be, you would be paid for each time it aired. Um you know, I still get my Star Trek checks from 1993, I think it was. Um, and they still are more than what the Orange is the Next Black actors are getting for their residuals. So now that it's streaming is 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 the the main way to view content uh, with network and, and on television, you had commercial ads and stuff that were going in and that was a way to justify why we need to keep getting our our fair share because we've helped create the product and in streaming uh the writers and the actors now it's a whole different model in terms of pay and on top of that it's less episodes for a show each season and then on top of that sometimes they still want exclusivity so that you know you work on a show and now you're waiting until you work again and so now you've been paid for a limited amount of time for that year um so what our potential for earning has dropped immeasurably compared to what we used to get and it's much harder now to make a living as an actor or a writer 
I think it's really important to say one more time, 87% of our union does not make the $26,000 that it takes to get health insurance. These are people that you recognize. A lot of them are people that you recognize. I don't have health insurance. I don't have, I mean, I have health insurance because I'm old and I have uh, uh, Medicare. But that said, uh, Armin and I have had health insurance for decades. It's a different world. And it's, and I worked a lot this year, but I'm not going to qualify because I can't use residuals. And that's because the, exactly what's happening in our business is happening in every business and drug companies and healthcare corporations uh, are pushing down the, the middle class and the lower classes and feeding their stockholders. Now, I'm happy to say I have some stock, but it doesn't mean that it's fair. It's not fair. I, there's a couple of things I, I want to clarify between what Tim and Kitty just said. So just so that the audience understands, we work many different, what we call schedules. We work different types of jobs. So also have different types of residual formulas for everywhere that we appear, or if a program gets moved from network to cable, or from streaming to cable or network to streaming. So just to get, I don't want to get too wonky, but there's a lot of different uh, ways. Modalities, that, different pay scales, yes. Uh, that will determine the different amounts of residuals that we'll get. The people on Orange is the New Black were getting the very minimal residual, which I also get when I was on Bosch, for, uh, because that was before we did the new streaming uh, contracts in 2017. So those residuals are coming to me in pennies and the people from Orange We did include that residual. Um, but the issue, as Kitty says, is that really it's kind of wonderful that we only need to make $26,000, which is maybe $2,000 above the poverty level in America, to uh, qualify for health insurance. That's a, that's a great thing. Uh, that's a, a wonderful level, right? But the tragedy is that no one can make the $26,000. And what they did is they reduced our health benefits quite a bit in 2020, 20, no, 2020 or 2019. 2019, they decided that people over 65, uh, oh, it was 2020. Yeah. 2020, they decided that, for instance, uh, they were gonna change the whole way that we qualify. And we had many tiers of qualification for our pension and health, for healthcare. Uh, it went away completely. Um, and then they, they changed something, which look, in reality was the way it was in old SAG. But in new SAG after in 2017, seniors could qualify with sessions, that means work days, plus their residuals, because those residuals are still being, uh, are still having money contributed to the, to the health and pension fund. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's kind of wonky and it's all over the place, but I just want you to know that they just kept taking things away from us. And every time we got a new kind of programming, our residuals kept going down and down and down. And then with the advent of self-tape, the competition went up and up and up. And so now I audition with people from all over the world that are going in for roles, for instance, because I um, am Hispanic, uh, Latina, Latinx, whatever the new thing is that they're calling us. Um, and so I'm actually competing with people internationally and they can hire anybody they want. So I'm sorry, I want to address something Bill said. We're actually in great danger and we have to understand that. But this is a, 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 an existential moment that is going to alter the complete future of our jobs. And, and this is why it is so important that we take a tremendous stand now and that we push back hard mm -hmm. because this AI issue will take jobs away from every single sector of this industry. Casting will disappear. Agents won't be needed anymore. Um, they can just copy anybody they want. 
So this is like a worldwide issue. Costumers won't be necessary. Stage managers won't be necessary. Sorry, I went, I went theater there. Uh, but production supervisors, IMPMs, all the UPMs, all of that will go away. So it's a threat to the entire industry worldwide. And the biggest issue really, really on the table is our pay. That we, it's about time we get some outsized raises. It's been 43 years that we've been dealing with these minimal raises that do not even address cost of living or inflation. And AI. Those are super big issues and they affect the entire world. The reason why they are so important right now is because in terms of AI, it's not at the point yet where they can say F you and see you later. So yeah. we have leverage there. And in terms of pay, everyone's in is getting hurt from inflation and all of this. And so it's really painful right now. And so we need we need to do it. Go ahead, Kitty. Sorry. I was just going to say it's not just our industry. It's every industry. AI is going to affect every single industry. It's going to affect every working person in America, every single working person in the world. Whether you're living in uh, Ukraine right now in the middle of a war, or you're living in Los Angeles, California, AI is a threat to all of us. Per person income has been drastically reduced as per person residual income per work show does not match what it was pre-streaming. Wow. There's another interesting thing I want to bring up. While I was having the thoughts that, oh my God, like Kitty just said, and like I previously said, this is going to affect the entire business in the world. I also had the thought that why is the AMPTP, why are the studios dealing with Amazon and Apple? Because basically Amazon and Apple are their enemy. I mean, honestly, the AMPTP should be striking with us. They should be on our side because I don't think that they would come up with such idiotic proposal on background if it wasn't that they actually don't know what they're going to do while Amazon and Apple are crawling through their networks, stealing content right now. So it's just extraordinary to me. I'm like, well, you're in the lion's den. And Netflix, you took in Netflix. Netflix made, made money by licensing your content. And the AMPTP, the studios, did not have the foresight to see that this is the way it was always going to go. So I, I personally believe that the studios are really dumbfounded. And I think, in a way, they're just as screwed. And they know it. Because they're dealing with the enemy right in their den. We at least know that this is going to affect everyone. I don't think they quite know that they're dealing with the enemy right within their own den. Yeah, and the strikes would be a lot shorter probably if it was just the studios, but because there's Netflix, because there's Amazon, Apple Plus, whatever, it's they're the ones that want to bleed us dry. I'm not sure. I'm not actually sure because Netflix has been in some ways with actors much easier to negotiate with than, for instance, the writers have had a really horrible time with the mini rooms and and the way that Netflix has basically treated them as almost disposable and really horrible. But with the actors, it's been a little distinction, okay? I don't know what's going on in those rooms, but I bet you they don't know what to do with AI. I bet you they don't have any idea. And right now, they're in their room, in their offices, trying to structure how they're going to deal with AI before they even come at us. Because... Honestly, if I were Amazon and Apple doing business, I'd be crawling through their content right now. There's nothing stopping them from stealing. Nothing at this moment. I mean, there's some piracy stuff and everything. There really isn't anything. So, so I want to kind of talk about some of the uh, bigger criticism also that I'm seeing of what's going on right now. And that's a lot of, again, back to the misinformation. There's a lot of misnomers about who the members of these unions are that are striking currently. So I'm seeing in some places people are saying, you know, why do these actors need residuals? Why are they getting paid multiple times for a job they've done once? Or I'm also seeing things like, you know, they don't need it. They're the 1% anyway. They already make all the money. So I'd love it if we can kind of address right now some of the, and I see Kitty shaking her head right now. I'd love it if we can kind of address some of these very ignorant claims that people are making and explain why all this stuff that's being fought over is so critical to you guys. Sure, absolutely. One of the things that's been discussed is that because of inflation, the increases that the negotiators uh, that the MPTP offered 
would put us at, at a real money less than what we got the last time we negotiated because of inflation. Mm -hmm. So even if we went up the, the 4% that they're offering, um, if in real dollars, that would be less than what we were making before. Uh, other people will bring up other things, but that's a major issue. Certainly, uh, as has been said over and over again, um, residuals are not what they used to be. And actors, especially working Joe actors, they live for those residuals because you don't work every week. You, you work when you can. And when those residual checks come in, they are a godsend. But, they, but if they don't pay for your bills, um, then you, you can't survive. And real fast, the reason why we get paid every time they show our image is because somebody's making money. <laughs> somebody's making money off of that. It doesn't matter whether we worked one day, a week, a month. It doesn't matter. They they are making income based on our images. The other thing about AI is that I was told decades ago to copyright my likeness. You know, for years and years and years, legacy performers, Audrey Hepburns, the John Waynes of the world, their um their offspring and their estates have made money off of their likeness because they were copyrighted. And they knew that they would be used after they passed away. So we're going to have to do that as well in terms of the AI situation. Um, but to just to answer the question about why we get residuals and why we get paid every time our likeness is shown is because somebody pays for that to happen and somebody gets paid when it happens. And we deserve a part of that. And we're creating that content. It's not like we're stapling scripts together or something. We're people are are they're getting their eyeballs and 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 their revenue because of the fact that people are are attracted to what we're creating for them. And so even the written page, the writers, yes, it's obvious to see how they're creating. For the mm -hmm. actors, maybe for a normal person, they go, well, you're just redoing the lines that were given to you. No, so much goes into interpretation of those lines. And so, so this is all about creation of product. It's, it's also that if people see you in one thing, Maybe somebody doesn't want to hire you for something else, and it changes your ability to get hired. You might be that lucky single person who vaults up through some piece of, uh, of television or film that they've done that changes their life and they work forever, but that's not usual. Usually what happens is if somebody sees you over and over and over again on something, you can't be then hired for something else. You're, you're, you're giving your soul and your art and your talent and your memorization and your time and your all of those things. And it stops uh, you bought, being bought someplace else because some commercial you did is showing over and over and over again. And only people only think of you as that or that whatever it is. You understand what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's self-limiting. That, that's actually, Kitty, that's actually what I was going to say. Exactly that. Because what happens is they burn our image. We're burnt out. We get burnt out. And that's what we're being compensated for. The fact that they are making money, reusing our image over and over and over again. And we're in danger of not being hired for other projects because we get burnt out. I mean, really, what's that girl on those progressive commercials? Can you see her doing anything else? I can, of course, because I know she's an actress, right? But the public or the marketeers in the studios cannot. So we're being paid for the burnout of our images. That's what we're being paid for. And, and because they make money off it every time. And I just want to really add that, you know, what Tim said is accurate. Well, we don't and we cannot do anything without the writers. Now, it's worth noting also that a lot of folks are, again, as we said, think it's only like the big time Hollywood folks that are doing this. And, you know, it's like the Tom Cruise and the Meryl Streep's or even the William Shatner's say his name, too. Uh, but really, it's about everybody else who's in this industry, who makes up this industry, whose backs are being broken, working every day and hustling every day to get onto shows. They're the ones who this is going to be affecting the most. And it, it pains me to see so many folks just not understand that point, because I'm just looking at the bigger picture. Also, in this very virtual room right now, I know we've got a few folks who have done Seinfeld. Uh, so these are, you know, many, many character actors who've done different things who had to get to a certain spot where they can maybe be a star in something, or they're just continuing to be working character actors. So I want to kind of stress this point here with you folks is that again, like the big 1% of top stars, they have agents who can work these things out, right? They get better deals. It's basically the working actors and the character actors and the everyday ambient extras and backgrounds. Like they're the ones who this is going to really be affecting the most. I would say for the viewers of this, please go and watch a movie or watch an episodic and pay attention to how many people you see cross that screen.
And then that makes that gives you an idea of those are all actors, <laughs> you know, and so there are a lot more than just the stars and uh, and it shouldn't be seen. And, 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 and all those actors that you see that aren't the main people in the show, they're really struggling to survive. I'm going to tell you something. This actually affects them, too. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Scarlett uh, Johansson, you know, she had to sue Disney because they screwed her out of her money. So, yeah, okay, they make exorbitant amounts of money. Fine. Great. Everybody should be entitled to make money, right? Uh, but that affects them, too. And I'll tell you, the images they'll be stealing uh, will be some of us on the uh, lower tiers and then even lower tiers, and whatever. I, I consider that we're all in the same boat, but just for just for this conversation, right? Uh, but it affects everyone. And look, we have an issue in this town because it's not just, how is it that Ari Emanuel is the person making the largest salary? Ari Emanuel is the head of an agency. So we have agents that can make 3% of production companies, there's a lot that goes on that, that affects everything. So I'm just going to say, yeah, the 1% will be affected just as well. Okay. But yeah, what we're speaking to is the middle class and working class actors. But those big agencies do affect the rest of us. You know, it affects the, the livelihood of, you know, of, of, of regular agents who have smaller agencies that have had to close over the years because of the conglomeration of these three big agencies now, because now it's three, it's four, now it's three. So those things affect us as well. And they affect everybody below that line. And they affect those 1% actors too. All, you know, you guys are, this is such a good panel you guys have. It's so perfect because we're so balanced. My issue is with the people who will feel the pain. Now we talk about the one percenters, you know, are they, yeah, will they feel it? Yeah, they'll feel it. Are they gonna feel the pain? that a young writer who just got a deal and now they can't work and they just left Walmart or wherever and now they got to go back there because who knows how long or the younger actor who just got a pilot and now that pilot's on the shelf and they don't know when they got to move back to Indiana or wherever they came from because that was their last month's rent and they just really made it. 87% <clears throat> of us don't reach the threshold, as Kitty said. So that's the poverty level, 87%. So when you, as an audience member, as your listeners who don't understand this paradigm, when they take it into consideration, understand that you're talking to actors on the screen here who have careers and who've established themselves at various levels. But we're not talking about that even. We're talking about the people who haven't established anything at all. And that's a lot of us. That's a great percentage of our, of our industry. And so we're fighting for all of us. We're not just fighting for Armin and Kitty and, and Tim and me and, 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 and everybody else on this and Berlita, to Bertilla and everybody else on this, we're fighting for everybody. My, because I'm doing well doesn't mean my industry's healthy. And so if my industry's not healthy, I'm not healthy. So I'm here for the dis-ease of the industry. Not mine, not the one percenters, but the bottom one percent, the bottom 87 percent. It's tough, man. And just like Phil just said and Kitty said earlier, this is reflective of society, of what we're dealing with in this country. That gap of the haves and have nots, it just keeps increasing, increasing, increasing. And at some point we need to stand up. That's the way change ever occurs. It is incumbent upon those of us who've had a good career to help the people who haven't, just as the people, when we were starting, there were people that reached down and helped us up. We, we stand on the shoulders of the people that came before. Now it's our turn to help the people who need help. And I'm so thankful to Armin. Sorry, just one last thing. And all the celebrities that you see, because they always take photos of them, you know, or or that you see them on the news. And that's what sort of gives the picture of for your your viewers and listeners that this is just about rich people wanting to be richer. It's not. I am so appreciative that they are out there because they know that they can help have an impact and affect change and help the rest of the membership. So I think one of the biggest differences we're seeing now, we've kind of started to talk about it here and there throughout this conversation, is who these unions are going up against. And it's not just studios this time. It is essentially tech companies that you're going up against. And that's also, I think, AI has become such an integral part of this conversation. And we've already mentioned how AI might not be there yet, but it will be there one day. And to be fair, that's actually 
they actually kind of already are there, whether folks realize it or not. And for folks who are video gamers, for example, like myself, we know uh, emotion cap performers, by the way, are covered in SAG-AFTRA. And motion cap performers work in the video game industry. And for the most part, a lot of folks will work on set for one day and they will have their likeness, they'll have their body reused. So it's already affecting industries. It just hasn't gotten to the point where they can completely replicate even being yet, but we're close. Those are two different contracts. The interactive motion capture is a completely different contract that's actually being negotiated now. The the performance capture actors only get coverage right now with Netflix. Ah, okay. Interesting. And it's worth explaining to your audience as well, as Bertello was just talking about, that we have several contracts, different contracts. Only the, the TV film contract and its subsidiaries are being struck. People can still do commercials. People can still do games. People can still do cartoons. That Those contracts are not being struck. Uh, people are beginning to think, oh, all actors are out of work. It's not true. The actors that work in the TV film contract, those are the ones that are affected. Although all of us who work in that field usually also work in the other fields as well. I wanted to point out something that because we have been um, advocating for people who do performance capture work for years, and they keep turning us down. It's another thing we brought to the table. So all those actors that you saw in Avatar, the background actors, they're paid a minimum amount of money daily. Um, And that's kind of extraordinary because it's an amazing skill to be a performance capture artist. Uh, There's something that I wanted to say, because I am a true journeyman actor, and I don't know if Kitty was going to say, I have never been a regular on a television series, ever. And kid, right? Uh, so I just want to reiterate that. And Tim over there, Tim. Okay. Um, you know, so we're real journeyman actors, and and you know, I'm I'm basically a working class actress. You know, middle class sometimes. Some years I'm good. Some years, you know, it's not so great. Uh, and I'm definitely an advocate, not for for us in the 87 percent, like Bill was talking about. Although. Thank God I did make my health insurance, but I don't know. Hopefully, William will have me covered next year. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to say that. And um, yeah, we work a lot of different different contracts, which we said at the beginning, what Armin just said. So there's differences in, in and this is this TV theatrical contract. We have not had a strike on this contract in 43 years. No, that's not true, Batella. So sorry. Uh, we have not had a strike with the writers in 42 years. We had a strike under Alan Rosenberg. We had a strike against this contract in, I believe, what was it, 19? A- after went out, after it made a deal and we didn't. So the SAG, SAG went out. It was before the merger. Uh, and, and SAG went out for this contract. That was not an actual strike. That was a delay in negotiations on the part of the Screen Actors Guild, and the Alan Rosenberg was president at the time. And look, I don't, I don't want to talk about that group of people, but that was not a strike. We had no strike authorization. We did not strike. What we did is withhold negotiations because we did not want to negotiate with AFTRA. And the leadership at that time told AFTRA that they could not negotiate 50-50 with us anymore, which was something we had done for the previous 27 years. So it wasn't actually a strike. It was a stoppage. We stopped negotiating the contract. AFTRA waited nine months and picked up the contract uh, that we still were withholding on um, because we had differences of opinion with the AMPTP and with our negotiating partners in AFTRA. So there was no strike at that time. And and why I know this is because that's why I came in to do the work in the union and why I said, okay, I'm going to run for office because this is madness that I was watching. And I, I had just done a Dexter or something and I had called the union wondering where was my race. <laughs> and they were like, oh yeah, you have no contract <laughs> because we were not negotiating. So it is the first strike in 43 years on this particular contract, although we, because we had a something happen in 1980. Uh, but it is the first contract. It is more than 43 years that we strike with the writers. The writers, uh, directors, and actors, we, we struck in 1960 or 63, something like that. 
And that's when we got our pension and health and residuals. 1960. 1960. Yeah, I know some pictures. So no, this contract and the and and, and the only reason is because look, I've been in two negotiations and I gotta tell you, oh, I, I don't think I've ever left one super happy. Okay. I think we go, okay, we made these deals. We'll do it, this this is better, this is not great. But I just like I said at the beginning, I think that you know, we have been good sports. Besides the fact that we're constantly being threatened and under pressure, like you won't get this job if you ask for this money and you won't get this if you want that. So we're constantly adjusting ourselves as actors to just do what we want to do. And I, and we're sick and tired of that. We're sick and tired of being disrespected. We're sick and tired of the undignified position that they put us in. We want to live lives with some dignity. And dignity means that you are able to live a life where you can afford to pay your rent, get your kids to school, uh, pay your health care, and get health care. That's dignity. And we are sick and tired of being denied a simple, dignified living. You guys are fighting for? Um, our, our raises. The simple fact outside raises, supposedly what we call outsides or what they call outside raises, uh, we're asking for them to meet, to give us parity with what has happened. Inflation was at 9% two years ago, three years ago. And not only that, we haven't had that over the last 43 years, because I myself have gotten up in negotiations. Our, our 3%, 3%, 3% over the three-year contract doesn't meet the cost of living over the past uh, 43 years. Doesn't meet the rate of inflation, which, by the way, in the 80s was incredibly high. Doesn't meet any of that. And we get points taken off our raises. So we make a deal and we say it's 3%, 3%, 3% for the three years of our contract. But maybe you're going to get the 3% the first year. But the second and third year, they take a percentage out of our raises so they can contribute that to our health and pension. So we need outside raises so that we can make a living, so that we can make our health plans, so that we can live with that dignity I just spoke about, because that is a really big issue. And I think it's the biggest issue next to, S next to, um, next to AI. And also, they need to contribute to our health fund. They keep taking and taking and taking away from our health funds. And, and that's insane. Here's the problem. The there's half of the trustees are from labor and half the trustees are from management and the trustees must protect the health plan. They cannot let it go bankrupt. So that's why we lose things. However, the, there's caps on what studios pay for an actor. They only pay into the health plan up to a certain rate. That rate hasn't been raised for over 40 years, over 40 years. So they're not paying more money for those actors that are carrying a television show or a film. And because that cap is not going up, it's compressing everybody else down. And so that the working class actor can't get the health insurance they need. If a regular actor has been on a series for five or six years and they go over the cap, right? They could be paying a lot of money the following year. They will not get health insurance coverage. Right. So there's, there's two caps. There's the cap per episode and there's the cap for the entire run of the show per, per season. So you can have actors who are working class actors who can't make their health insurance when the show goes to streaming or cable or whatever because they're not getting contributions anymore. And those actors may never work again and often do not. But their face is out there and the reason why they're not working is exactly the point that Tilla made before. And then one other key item that's separate from that is that in order to have an accurate, you know, uh, gauge of what residuals should be paid to actors, we need to be able to see the numbers. What is the viewership of each, you know, show and episode and stuff? And Kitty Boat in the past was very influential. There was something called the residual study back in the uh, early the turn of the century. And uh, she and her committee were able through the negotiating committee go in and we negotiated so that we could look at those books. Um, that ability has disappeared now. And, and Tim is absolutely right. Without knowing what the bottom line is for the people we are negotiating across the table with, there's, there's no real 
uh, hard and fast thing that we can hold on to. We can only talk about anecdotal information. We need to see those figures in order to be able to ask for a fair share, whether it's more or less. Without those numbers, we, we're only reading tea leaves. And I, to tell you the truth, I don't think the stockholders for Netflix or Amazon or any of those places have seen the books either. And if they did, I think they'd be shocked. Yeah, I think they would be shocked as well. I, I mean, it was shocking to hear that Squid Games, because this is the issue with streaming. We do have measures. We can actually see how the rating of a network TV show are going. So we And we understand how much revenue they can get in a show through their advertising. But streaming gives us no transparency. And it was shocking to read Good Games had made $900 million. And that writer only saw only saw his original pay, which maybe could have been 30 grand, 40 grand. We don't know, you know? And so it's extraordinary to find out that that much money was made. And I, I knew that they're a little pissed off in Korea as well. I'm really hope. And look, I want to say we've gotten support. I'm getting DMs from all over the world. Um, I, I happen to speak several languages. And so I'm getting DMs from Argentina, from Spain. Um, I'm doing an interview in Spain in, in, a, in a few days. Uh, we're getting from Germany, from all over. Uh, they are supporting this. And it's on news. I, I was getting DMs from Prague. My girlfriend's in Prague. And she's like, oh, God, it's okay. Tell me this. You know, asking questions. So this has become a real international issue. And I just really want to thank everybody for their support. And I hope we get continued support. Now, before I was working here in this world of Star Trek and sci-fi and nerdy stuff, I was a combat sports journalist. And so I was covering things like kickboxing, UFC, mixed martial arts, wrestling, you know, actual collegiate wrestling, not pro wrestling necessarily. Uh, and, you know, I know that when you talk to a fighter, you don't necessarily ask them, what's your strategy for your next fight? And today we're talking about a fight. So, Phil, I want to throw this to you first. I know I can't ask you guys, what's your strategy to win? But what would you say is the greatest weakness that the AMPTP has that you guys can take advantage of? Our unity, you know, our coming together, um, hearing our voices, because we do have incredible minds. And I really appreciate everybody who's at the negotiating table on our end and, and who uses their time wisely and uses their talent wisely. <clears throat> I honor all the people who are walking in the line and 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 suffering in the heat or lack of water and food and time away from their careers to do this very necessary work. Um, that's our strength. That's our positivity. I would caution the producers that, you know, when my father started, there were only three networks. There was no YouTube. There was no way to self-promote. You needed a PR agent. You needed an agent agent. The industry relied on you to rely on it. As we've evolved, as we have matured, we have found more ways to self-generate our projects without studios. We found more ways to assist our own creative expression without a network. So we will find a way. Art will find its way. Commerce, not so sure. So I want everybody be, to be aware of the fact that like when I come home, I don't say, hey, look, I made this beautiful little, and this was my invention. No, what we do is this. It goes bye-bye. And yeah. so we have to quantify it by paying us a, a living wage. But what we do is dreams, people. That's why That's why Berlita, here, Bertilla, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because I do not know you. This is my first time meeting you. That's why she's getting messages from all over the world. Because the world wants us to win. They kind of get it. When times are tough, what do they go to? Entertainment. They want to escape through what we do, not what the network executives do, not what the studio bosses do, what we do. So when we can, back to my original point, when we can figure out that that's the game we're playing and not this other game that they think we're playing, then we'll get the respect we deserve. The power that we have is right now in this strike is denying them content. So I think Netflix could probably wear a little longer, but in a little bit, in September, when that fall lineup is empty and they've got to put in reruns of SUV and Law and & Order and whatever else they've got going, they're going to feel it. That's what we can withhold. That is the weakness that the AMPTP, Netflix, and Amazon and Apple have is that we can withhold content. And as long as the rest of the world continues to support us, British equity supporting us, because we have unions all over the world 
the actors. This is the largest entertainment unit here in America. But make no mistake about it, you know, big shows aren't SAG after all, like Game of Thrones and House of Dragons and a whole bunch of other shows. So as long as the global community can support us, and as long as we withhold content, that is the weakness that for the AMPTP. And the other thing I think is their weakness is I don't think they know what the hell to do to monetize AI and to keep Amazon and Apple out of their content. That's the other weakness. If they're actually dealing with the devil right in their house. And the other weakness in terms of the strike is that is underestimating. We are actors. We are writers. We are used to being struggling artists. Every actor, every writer has struggled at some point, and we can do this all day, and we will do it, and our passion. We're all, we're very passionate people, so we have strength, we have unity, we have passion, we have artistry. We're there. I'm going to tell a story. I was walking the picket line last week with a friend of mine who's a writer. She had befriended a young woman who was 21 years old who's a senior in college, on every day off from her summer job, she comes and pickets. And why does she do that? Because she's a writer and an actor, and at some point in her life, she wants to be paid a living wage. That's our strength. Our future is our strength. And if I may add one last comment. The AMPTP is made up of different companies, different studios. Each of those studios has their own agenda. If the strike lasts long enough, those different entities will start to butt heads with each other for the very reasons that everybody has said. So in time, those entities will begin to bicker and eventually someone will win that, that uh, particular contest and, and they'll come to terms with the actors union and the writers union because everybody will know what's the right thing to do. Even at this 5% inadequate raise that they came back at us with, they individually are putting out maybe 30 million each over like each each year, right? I mean, you know, when you think about the fact that Bob Eager or Igor or whatever, I call him Igor, okay? I, I can only call him Igor, makes $27 million a year. So at the rate of what they were offering, Really, each studio is only putting out about 30 million bucks a year over the three year contract. Okay. That's basically what it broke down to. It's a wonderful spreadsheet. I was going to post it, but I, I think people won't understand it on Twitter. I don't know. I'm not underestimating, but it's just a little complicated, uh, because of the way he wrote it. Uh, and I don't want people to think that's what we're going to settle for because that 5% is not enough. But that's all it would cost them. So imagine if we, if we just said 10%, it would cost them maybe 60 million. Right, which is still what some of them uh, of the CEOs are making yearly. Just to go on the back of what Armin said about that, these are eleven different companies actually negotiating together. So it's David, like David Zaslav made two hundred and forty-three million dollars. His single salary would have paid everything the writers asked for for ten years for every writer that worked. One year's salary for one person. Exactly. I think that's Ari Emanuel that was like, really, it's extraordinary. Thank you, Kitty. Yeah. I do want to make one last little note here for folks who are listening to the show, because I know that, um, you know, there's many things we didn't cover today in this hour, but uh, Armin, this is something that I know you were on Twitter about recently, which was about conventions and that sort of thing, because I know a lot of folks are listening, you know, they they clearly want to support things like the strike, but they still want to watch things on streaming platforms. They still want to go to conventions and see folks. Uh, and I know some things have still been working on being clarified. Uh, but Armin, can you kind of tell us like where we're at in terms of cons and that kind of thing? And is it okay for folks like me to still watch Paramount Plus or other things like this? Uh, well, to answer your last question first, and the best of my ability, this is my opinion. Uh, I know people have been advocating that uh, in order to support the striking artists, they should cancel their streaming contributions. I am not of that mind, and I may be in the minority, but I am not of that mind because if if the streaming business goes out of business, when the strike is concluded, I want there to be a platform that all of us can go back to work at. Once we have rectified what the pay salaries are and the contributions and the safety protocols are, I want to be able to go back to work. I want my friends to go back to work. I don't want to destroy the industry that now exists. So 
I would not advocate uh, uh, canceling. Uh, cut back, certainly, if you have to. But, but, but no, I don't agree with canceling all your streaming services. Um, as far as conventions is concerned, as I understand it, and I think I'm pretty knowledgeable about this, um, actors can indeed go to a convention and sign anything that's put in front of them. If a science fiction show that I appeared on, a picture, a merchandise, a script, a poster, even though I'm, my union is asking me not to mention their names and not to advocate for them and not to publicize for them, if it's put down in front of me, that the union is saying, go ahead, sign it. So that should be clear to everybody. Um, we, the union is asking its members, as we have demonstrated here today, not to talk about the entities that we worked for, whether it's the studio or whether it's the show itself. So we won't do that, but, but certainly it provides the opportunity for, for fans uh, to ask questions, personal questions about their work, about actors' work habits, about relationships, about how they approach the business. All of that is up for grabs and is still there. And as I said before, at conventions, though we cannot talk about the, um, the film and TV contract, we can talk about the other contracts that we're not striking. So I can talk uh, about Bioshock. I can talk about Ratchet and Clank. I can mention their names and no one's going to penalize me because that's a different contract. I hope that answered your question. And and you won't when you go to a convention. You can't go to a convention. We can't go to a convention that's owned by one of the employer entities. But if it's an independent convention, what you won't see is Armin's picture dressed up like any of those characters behind him, or my picture, or Phil's picture, with any of those characters, or Tim's, or and Bertilla. I don't know if there's pictures for. That show that you did with all my friends, but uh, there might be that too. So we can't do that, but we can sit there as uh, Phil or Tim or Armin. And primarily, when someone comes up to the table, yes, they start with a conversation about the work that we've done, but invariably, if we have the time, we go on to other things. We ask them about their family. We relate as people relate. The table separates us, but we try to do away with the table as quickly as possible. So for all the folks out there who are listening, who are watching today, who want to support the cause, what can we do? You know, we a lot of us can't be out there striking and picketing with you guys, but for folks like me who are in other places, you know, what can we do to show our support and help you guys? Well, if you if you, if you want to and you have a little spare uh, money, uh, you can actually uh, contribute to the SAG uh, after a foundation, the Entertainment Community Fund, or the Motion Picture and Television Fund. And you can target, you can write this contribution uh, and anything is appreciated. So, um, because it's also the spirit of giving, right? And supporting the actors and performers and the writers. Uh, you can target it. You can say this money is for uh, the people and, you know, for the strike. You can, you can actually write that in your contribution. And, and take what you've learned from here. And when you see someone else saying something like, oh, why do we need to help those rich artists get rich or whatever? Just let them know that's actually not the case, you know? And if you give to the entertainment part of the motion picture fund, you can help the grips that are out of work and the makeup artists that are out of work and the, everybody else. I mean, if you, if you don't feel like you want to support us, then support other people because, because one of the CEOs said and was caught on tape saying, we're going to keep them out until they lose their homes, and then they'll take whatever we offer them. And we don't want people losing their homes. We don't want anybody in any industry losing their homes. And when they uh, say something like that, it's not just the writers and actors that they're doing that to. It's all the ancillary services that you find, you know, whether it's a hairdresser, whether it's a caterer, what, what have you. Prop shop. Yeah, uh, don't get this confused with it's just the people that you see on screen. There's so many support industries that help us be on screen that they are affected as well uh, sometimes more because they work sometimes every day and, and i don't work every day you know they're there day in and day out they're there when we get there they're there there when we leave so please understand this is a this is pain for on a universal level it's not just targeted the other thing is um bertilla makes a very good point the funds are incredibly important to actors who are who are in need of that to performers who are in need of those those resources so please search those out the other thing you can do is 
if you miss your entertainment, write about it. Tell them. Just just say, I love this actor. I miss them. I love this show. I miss it. I want to have this. You know, you tell them as an audience that you want this done with. You tell them as their consumer that you're tired of this, that you want to have your performers, the ones that you idolize, you love, equitably uh, compensated. Trust and believe they will listen, especially if you're in, in numbers. So you do have the power of the pen, as we used to say. And please let them know your 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 sense of this this situation, especially after you've heard these people talk about it and you get a certain inside understanding. Um, it's really important. I know myself and many other people who've just advocated for the strike and, we, and we're 100%, 110% behind it. But I do want to apologize to all the people that the, that the strike is affecting and they don't have a vote in this. All the people that Tim and Phil and Bertilla and Kitty have mentioned that aren't part of this strike and whose businesses are being affected because, because the actors and the writers are on strike. It is, as we said at the very top, it is the last thing we think about when we go into negotiations and we know that it hurts people. And, and for me and from all those like me who feel the same way, my apologies for this, but it will be over and, and things will go back eventually. I'm with you, Armin, and I'm also hoping that our strike will support better contracts for IOTC and any of the other uh, unions involved in, in our work and across our town. Because right now, hotels, workers are striking. UPS is in very hostile negotiations right now. That's the largest contract in the entire country. Uh, so, yeah, I'm with I you. Think the auto workers after them? Or... Oh. It's yeah. the unions that made the middle class. It is a shame what has happened to the unions. We are here advocating not just for our union, but for all unions. And I think that's kind of the moral of this episode also is really what's happening right now in Hollywood is indicative of what's happening throughout this country and so many other places. It's going to be trickling down across many other facets of what we do, whether it's professionally or personally. So uh, you know, you guys have all my support, and I want to thank you all very much again for being here, for talking us through all of this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ignorance and misunderstanding out there, and I'm, I will admittedly say that, you know, a lot of the stuff, I don't know either. I'm pretty ignorant to it, but I appreciate you guys breaking it all down for us uh, in a way that's very easy to understand. And, uh, you know, I, I normally like to end these episodes with all sorts of little quotes that are from a certain show, um, but I am going to use one that is beyond that franchise. Uh, and the way I always end my shows is with a Latin saying, which is in English, fortune favors the bold. So I believe that uh, what's happening right now is very much seeing that in action. So fortune favors the bold, and I wish everybody in this community all the success and that we get what we want and we all can get back to not just normalcy, but something better than what we had before. Awesome. Thank, thank you for having us. So once again, I want to thank all of my guests for joining me today on very short notice to get this episode out there. And I'm so appreciative of them for giving me their time, their generosity with their knowledge, and helping all of us fill in these blanks so that we can better support them better understand their plight, and better talk to others about it too. Ignorance breeds ignorance, and the only way to fight back against it is with knowledge. And everybody who joined us today for this panel gave us a wonderful gift that we can use and share with others. Now, as we already mentioned, there are a few different ways you can support the causes right now. We already mentioned the Entertainment Community Fund, and you can visit them at entertainmentcommunity.org to find out how to donate to their cause. You can also support the SAG After Foundation, which is located at sagaftra.foundation. And last but certainly not least, there's also the Motion Picture Television Fund, which you can go to mptf.com to learn how you could support them there. I will say most of these sites have a page with like a suggested donation, and it's usually some kind of big numbers, but if you're not comfortable with those numbers, and frankly a lot of us won't be, I know myself, I'm not, uh, there is a spot where you can donate a number of your choosing. So it doesn't need to be four digits, it doesn't even need to be three digits, it doesn't even need to be two digits if you don't want it to be. It's whatever you're comfortable giving. And since this show has been all about misnomers and misinformation and fighting back against some ignorant claims, a lot of people are going to probably be saying right now, why should I donate to actors? As if they didn't listen to the entire show and didn't hear what we just talked about. But why should we donate to these folks? Why shouldn't we be donating to the homeless instead? Or to cure cancer or other things? And my response to that is simply, okay, do that too. Nobody's stopping you from donating to all these good causes. So yes, please continue to support the fight against pediatric cancer or support folks getting the proper shelters. Whatever you want to do, of course, keep doing it. No one's stopping you. Please help them out. 
but also consider just donating a little bit of that money and your energy to these places as well. The people you're supporting at these websites are the folks who are giving you entertainment, who are helping you escape the harsh realities of the world, even for a few minutes, and inspiring you to do bigger and better things with your own lives. Whether that means looking at something through a different perspective, having a laugh, or just watching something explode. It took these talented people and all the crews around them to make it happen. And again, just to stress this, while this current strike is essentially just writers and actors and performers and folks who fall under the WGA and the SAG-AFTRA umbrellas, it's all the crew people who are affected too, because as these doors close for production, gone too are the jobs for the riggers, for the lighters, for the grips, for the camera people, for the sound people, for everybody out there who works behind the scenes, and likewise, the folks who work in post-production, they're going to have a little bit of a struggle right now too. There's less stuff to edit, there's less stuff to fix sound in, there's less work for visual effects artists, there's so much stuff that's going around, and that's really why this has to happen. Strikes are purposefully meant to be disruptive. It's not just to prove a point, it's because, as we said already, it's the last resort to failed negotiations. Nobody wants to go on strike, but sometimes you have to. As far as when this strike will end, of course, I have zero idea, and my panel really doesn't know that either, but I can say in the time being, we are likely to see a little bit of a renaissance in the arts as well. In the past, when we had writer's strikes, we were suddenly bombarded with things like more reality shows, and I expect that to be something that happens also, along with seeing more international programming start to pop up. But what also might start happening is more independent movies will start showing up. And there's so many great indie movies out there that really don't get the spotlights that they deserve, so now is truly a prime chance for something like that to happen. YouTube, of course, will not shut down. YouTube is its own thing, and YouTube is not affected by any of this. So YouTubers like myself and plenty of other folks out there will continue to produce content, as well as podcasters. So we might see more podcasts pop up with more of these people who've got a little bit more free time at the moment. And a lot of these people might just go back to their roots and the roots of performing in theater. So there's a pretty high chance not only Broadway will get a little bit of a boost, but other theaters and other productions across the country who do stage shows might suddenly see more of those actors, those performers, flocking to these places just to perform. And truly, I kind of hope that that is part of the end game here, a higher appreciation for the arts across the board. There's so many creative people that are affected by this, and there's such an undervaluation of the arts by the general public out there that now seems like the perfect time that maybe something will change and help be more of a light at the end of the tunnel for these people. And I don't want to keep going on a bigger tangent here because I easily can, but that's kind of just my thoughts on this. And as far as this goes, we will be keeping tabs on this and we will certainly revisit what's happening in Hollywood again on this show sometime in the next season. And speaking of, this is essentially going to be it for me for this season of Trek Untold as well. I'm taking my annual summer break and I will be back in September with more interviews. I already have a bunch I've done, in fact. And so just a reminder to people, all those interviews that you're going to be seeing start popping up in September on this channel were all done well before the strike began. And I'm very excited for you guys to see some of these guests because, again, I've got some hidden gems. I have some people who haven't done interviews in a long time, if ever. We're talking to actors, we're talking to writers, we're talking to some real legends and some real wonderful treasures out there. I can't wait for you guys to hear everything that we're going to have on Season 4 of Trek Untold. So that's it for this episode of Trek Untold. I didn't really promote myself throughout this one here. I'll do it right now just to get it out of the way, but I really felt like, you know, I didn't want to take off any of the importance from what my guests were discussing. But hey, if you can, follow me on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and on TikTok, at Trek Untold. Make sure to subscribe to me if you're listening to this on the podcast platforms, or if you're here watching this on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe at youtube.com slash at Trek Untold. If you'd like to financially support this show, I also do have a Patreon. That's patreon.com slash trekuntold. And over there, you'll get early access to interviews, have the chance to potentially ask guests questions, and some other benefits as well. So please consider supporting me on Patreon. I've also got some other stuff like a store and an Amazon storefront and those things, but you'll find all the links for that in the show notes. I'm not going to talk about it too much today. But again, do check out the show notes, not for my own self-promotional purposes, but check them out to see some of the links that my guests today provided with me, because after the interview is over, I asked them if they had anything they wanted me to share, please send it, and everybody obliged. So there's more reading material down below as well as some videos. Check that out and get yourself educated on what's going on, and don't stop fighting the good fight. So until next time, I'm Matthew. This has been Trek Untold. As I already told my guests, and now I'll tell you, fortune favors the bold. We'll see you guys next time. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.